So we're back in Nehemiah. Um, last time, uh, a few times we, ago, we saw Ezra read the law. We saw people absolutely absorbed and seemed to have, it was a fantastic time. And then people said, oh, we've got to praise God and repent. And they said, not at the moment, it, it, it's the day of uh, Passover, a tabernacle. So they kept that feast, and now we're back again to the main thing. It's their time of praying and, and seeking repentance from God. So I'm very, very solemn about what we're doing today. So could I ask David to read number one, please? Nehemiah 9. Now on the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. And the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day. For another quarter of it, they made confession and worshipped their God. On the stairs of the Levites stood Jeshua, Bani, Kadmiel, Shibaniah, Bani, Shiriah, Bani, and Shenai. And they cried with a loud voice to their God. Then the Levites said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. You are the Lord, you alone. You have made heaven, the heaven of the heavens, with all their host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. And you preserve the, all of them. And the host of heaven worships you. You are the Lord, the God who chose Abraham, Abraham and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans, gave him the name Abraham. And it ties on to be a very, very long prayer. Prayer of repentance, God. Mm -hmm. So we see the priority of the word of God when Ezra stood up and, and preached and they listened and they did something to it. And then we have a, a time of heart revival. And now we see a time of repentance. A time of heart purification. Turning to God in worship and praise and a determination to change. So, all the elements of worship service are here, repentance, confession, hearing the word, and praising and blessing God, remembering who he is, what great things he has done, and seeking his power to live in a good kind of way. And then in chapter 10, they carry out their commitment to make changes in their lives, some very big ones. So whatever worship is, it's drawing near to God. Because he's revealed himself in scripture and we draw near to that God. Not just any old God that we think of. You know, my God, my truth, or something. The God who's revealed in, in scripture. With the response of adoration, praise, and obedience. Saying, Lord, you are so worthy just as you are. Now I'm going to ask uh, Eileen to read three... Um, Draw near passages from Hebrews. Yeah. <coughs> yes. Two, three, and four. Hebrews 4 16. Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews 7 25. Hence also he is able to save forever those who draw near to God. God is not a spectator's for No one can draw near for you. You've got to do the drawing here. And 
No one can purify your heart for you. So worship is you drawing near to God. You aren't here to watch or enjoy a performance. Worship's not for our benefit first. The whole focus and the point of worship is God. Scripture gives us a truth and directs us to, to God and then in true worship we then approach Him. Um, so, for example, we have this passage in 1 Corinthians. But if all prophesy and, and an unbeliever or an outsider will come in, he is convinced by all. Sometimes he He is called to account for all. The secrets of the heart are disclosed. And so, falling on his face, he will worship God. Declare God is really among you. That's what we're aiming for, isn't it? For God to be really amongst us. So how do we prepare for worship of the God in spirit in truth? They came before God with fasting, sackcloth, and dust on their heads. Sackcloth is coarse, hairy goat skins used for sacks, um, and it's used for showing that they're humble. Same with the, the dust on their heads. It's an external display of something deep going on in their hearts. They confess their sins. Confession reveals all you've got hidden in your life. And they fully acknowledge that their forebearers had sinned and the lot of evil. Indeed, that was the point of the Babylonian exile. They now come back again and they wanted to not do the same all over again. They grievously sinned against God. That was the, the story of their history. You go through the Old Testament, that's the story. Fairly, most of the time. But God's come to God. So how do we prepare our hearts for worship? Not just on Sunday mornings, but we should be entering and, and praising God and worshiping Him all the time. So, first of all, how do we do that? We repent of our sins and we seek God's face. Mm. So could I ask uh, Lindsay to read 5 and 6 and could I ask uh, uh, Flo to read 7? <coughs> Psalm 51, 16, 17. You do not delight in sacrifice or I will bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. And Isaiah 66 2 says, God looks to the one who is humble and contrite of spirit, and who trembles at my word. Just the following starts. Broken and flow. A broken and contrite heart, humble and contrite of spirit, and trembles when he reads the Bible. Amen. Flow, sorry. Isaiah 1 11. What are your multiplied sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires you this champion of my cause? Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure in iniquity and the solemn assembly. I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. They have become a burden to me. I will cried. I am weary of bearing. So when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. No playing with God. Yeah, mm -hmm. this is. Yeah. yeah, so full of sarcasm. So just to make people wake up to see what they've done. I can't stand iniquity and solemn assembly. Mm -hmm. I can't stand doing something evil and then doing something religious and pretending mm -hmm. to be all pure. Mm -hmm. Don't do iniquity, don't play with God. Mm -hmm. Repentance is the prerequisite for worship. It's not a small issue in the Bible. And remember, Martin Luther put up his 95 theses in Wittenberg Cathedral, mm -hmm. his first one. When our Lord and Master Jesus says, repent, he wanted the entire life of a believer to be one of repentance. Mm -hmm. 
Our whole life is to be one of repentance. Thoroughly change your thinking, which is easy to do when it comes to stocks and shares, but it's when with it's your life that is quite difficult to do. Indeed, we can't do it unless God helps us to do it. We must let God guide us to which sins and things we have got, and we must then repent of them with God's So, uh, at Pentecost, Paul preached, and then they cried out at the end, What shall we do? And Paul said, Repent! Paul then, so Peter, Paul then told the Athenians that God commands all men everywhere to repent and believe in Jesus. Jonathan Edwards, who was involved in the, uh, in the 1730s in the Great Awakening in America, same time as a similar revival was going on with John, John Wesley and uh, Whitfield. A good description of repentance. Acknowledge our own sinfulness and unworthiness, and to renounce our own goodness and all confidence in ourselves and our works, and instead trust only in the sacrifice of Jesus. So repentance is a gift from God, which we can't do without him, and do the hand we're told, get on and do that. great psalm is Psalm 51, uh, after David confronted him with, his, with, his, with the murder and adultery he's committed, David said, I sin. Then he wrote this, not on your sheet. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I have known my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words, and blameless in your judgments. The prodigal son did what? He repented. He became aware of his offensiveness against his father. I've been wrong. I will arise. I'm not worthy. Make me a mere servant slave. That publican who went up to pray at the same time as the Pharisee didn't even have the nerve to look up to God's face. He bowed down his head and said, God be merciful to me a sinner. True repentance of Seems easy, but it isn't. Because it means we have to come down from our high horse pride. Pride is often behind our rebellion sometimes. We may say how much we've learned, or sort of call attention to how we've repented, and then still be smugly entrenched on pride's hill. There are two kinds of apparent repentance. So, could you read nine to me, uh, uh, Sonia? Corinthians 7. Uh, for godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Godly grief, worldly grief. One is superficial, self centered, it's the sorrow of the world, it leads to death. That's worldly repentance. True repentance leads to genuine change and restitution. A worldly repentance means, I'm sorry I got caught, sorry others have found me out, and think less of me now, sorry I can't keep on doing this thing, sorry, but not sorry enough to thoroughly change my mind and quit going my own way. Jesus said, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. He also told several churches in Revelation that they had better repent. I think seven, seven churches, five, repent. Thoroughly change your mind, turn back to God, or he would remove their witness in this world. For example, listen to Paul in number eight. Uh, David, can you use number eight for me? I'm afraid that when I come again, my God may humiliate me before you, and I may mourn over many of those who have sinned in the past, and not repented of the impurity, immorality, 
and sensuality which they have practiced. We are true repenters then when we humble enough to confess and turn and do whatever God says to make it right. That true repentance. We become true learners, and this is the broken spirit of Psalm 51 17, uh, which could be translated The way to please you, O Lord, mm. is to be truly sorry deep in our hearts. This is the kind of sacrifice that you won't refuse. So, we can't come before God with our complete self-sufficiency and full of our self-esteem. No, we must come before God in, in humility and say, show us where we should change. How we could, and then give us firm commitment to actually change. Right. So I came to your house and murdered all your favourite dogs and cats and birds and fish and turned over your furniture spray paint on the wall, oh, I look forward to doing that. Oh. And then next week I came to you and told you, I love you, here's some oh. beautiful flowers, here's an expensive box of chocolates. Oh. <laughs> what, what would you think? Oh. <laughs> but that's what we do to God. <laughs> so what are the fruits of repentance? First of all, honesty. No more rationalising and making excuses for your sin. Uh, no blaming my personality, my past, my lust, my genetic uh, makeup, my hormones, my disorder, my parents, my background, other people, stress or anything. True repentance just says, God, I've been wrong. I need your forgiveness. I'm willing to change and let you help me. Laying your heart out on God's surgery table and letting him have it, cutting it and playing it however he wants, however much he hurts. Mm. Mourning, genuine heart grief over offending God. Blessed are the mourners, not necessarily with tears, you don't need that, but that's all right then, but that inner sense that I've offended the glorious, wonderful God. You realise your sin costs nothing less than the blood of Jesus for forgiveness. Free confession. Free, open confession of sin. Whoever covers his sin shall not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them, they shall have mercy. We're not talking about getting up and trying to impress people with how humble you are when you confess your sins. Even confessing sins can, can be, a, 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 be done on pride there, can not it? Because you can twist everything to your glory rather than God's glory. This steps on our pride. And for restitution, doing whatever it takes to be reconciled, willing to pay any damages, take the time rebuild trust, seek forgiveness and accountability. It may be to a spouse, a parent, a child, a fellow Christian, a business person, a partner. Jesus says, before you worship, first go and be reconciled to your neighbour. Then come and worship. And without restitution, there's no true repentance. Without heart repentance, that thorough change in your way of thinking, there is no worship of God. It will be like coming before your spouse drenched in urine. When we come before God to worship Him in spirit and in truth, we should become keenly aware of our sinfulness in God's eyes. This should always lead us to repenting, confessing our offences and need of the sovereign mercy upon Jesus. Turning to do what God commands us to do to make right. This is the broken and contrite spirit he will not despise. And only God can give us this kind of spirit. That is why we ask him to break our hearts, to search us, to try us, see if there's any wicked way in us in Psalm 119. When he does, and when we repent, like the prodigal father, he receives us with 
grace and mercy gives us, cleanses us, and then we can offer sacrifices of praise and worship. There's a famous hymn, Come Thou Font of Every Blessing, really old one, I hope you remember it. It says, O oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Even better, prone to wander, Lord. I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. O oh, take and seal it. See, seal it for thy courts above. Amen. Just before we pray, remember the great number 10. <laughs> Lindsay, you're a leader. <laughs> when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locusts to, to devour the land, or send pestilence amongst my people, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. Oh dear, I can see the word of heaven. Turn from their wicked words. Uh, the Old Testament uses the word turn. So. Oh, let me be prone to wander marvel and be full of gratitude and thank you for your love, care and faithfulness. Let us be prone to thanks and praise, mm. O Lord and Father, not prone to wander away, mm. wander away from you. Search our hearts, cleanse away all our sin, mm. and then make us instruments in your service. Mm. That we may expand to that. Your 